three types of I guess. Hey, sisters. <laughs> Imagine opening your bio thing, video and be, hey, sisters. Um, there's three types of relationships, interspecific relationships. We talked about them yesterday. This is an example of commensalism, a bird making a nest in the tree. The tree doesn't benefit from the bird being there. It could, couldn't it? tree isn't really hurt by the bird. It's kind of oblivious to the bird, and the, but the bird has a place to live. So the bird benefits, bird benefits, tree does not, that's commensalism. Here's another example of commensalism. The clownfish in the sea anemone. The clownfish benefits because it gets a place to live where nothing will come after it because the sea anemone has a sting. Did y'all know that? Clownfish is immune to the sting. Who likes clownfish? Yeah. Nemo. <laughs> um, but uh, the sea anemone isn't helped or hurt, so that's a commensalistic relationship. I'll come back to that video in a minute. Um, what about mutualism? Well, uh, a mutualistic relationship in animals are the, ter are the termites and the bacteria that live in their guts. Did y'all know termites can eat wood? Yeah. The termite itself cannot digest the wood. It's the bacteria in the gut of the termite that digests the wood. So the bacteria living in the gut of the termite gets food, wood, and gives some of it some of the digested material goes to the termite. So they're helping one another. Isn't that great? That's pretty cool. Uh, this is a lichen. A lichen is a fungus and an algae living together. The fungus absorbs water from the air, and the algae makes food by photosynthesis. And it's a very successful partnership. Lichen can grow almost anywhere, except where there's heavy pollution. Pollution kills lichen because the, the uh, air is so important to their metabolism. They're pulling water from the air. They pull in pollution from the air, too. So um, that'll, that'll kill them. You don't see lichens in the middle of big cities. You can always tell if the air is good somewhere by looking for lichen. So that's mutualism. Uh, here's another, another common example of mutualism. These cleaner fish that pull off, that kind of go, they'll go inside the mouth of a bigger fish. Could you imagine a more dangerous place if you're a little fish? But these things will go inside the mouth and pick off little parasites and things from inside the mouth. They're basically cleaning their mouth. And they don't get eaten. So this. The big fish gets its mouth cleaned, and the little fish gets food. You could imagine the big fish could easily just swallow that thing and get food, but then it wouldn't get its mouth cleaned. What are the benefits of that? Of getting your mouth clean? Yeah. You don't get, it's kind of like brushing your teeth. Okay. You don't get mouth infections. Fish get mouth infections? Oh, yeah. They, they would if they didn't have their mouth cleaned. <laughs> yeah. And here's a great example, I talked about it yesterday, of mutualism. The ant and the acacia tree. I got a good video of footage of this. The ant and the acacia tree. I wonder, if, is there a way to pause the camera without turning it on? Yeah. There is? Uh-huh. Like you can pause it? You can pause it without stopping it? Uh, I can pause it, yes, and then I guess un... Was that in the video, though? That's what I'm saying. I don't want yeah. it in the video. Oh, so, I don't... I have no clue. Do me a favor. Just put the camera face down, but cover it up.
because uh, why? In Africa, there are a great number of uh, valid uh, YouTube. YouTube will cut it off, uh, even though it's legal because I'm the only show on a quota that like, matches it. With, uh, what is this from? This is from, uh, um, what's the English? Yeah, it's like, it's one of those shows. Blooming plant eaters. Cover it up so you can't hear it. <laughs> Acacias protect themselves with spines, but they're by no means a total defense. Some animals, it's true, are put off by them, but others, like a giraffe, seem able to ignore them. as guards and provide them with special barracks, the swollen bases of their thorns. One nibble from the giraffe is enough to bring out the defenders. moves away. Several different acacias employ ants as defenders. As well as providing accommodation, the trees pay their security staff with a sugary nectar that wells up from little glands on their stems. This South American species rewards its ants even more extravagantly. It not only produces nectar for them, but packets of protein, little beads that grow on the tip of its leaflets. But these are not for the adults. They're special baby food, which the workers take back to their larvae. These infants are housed in the swollen bases of the forms. The worker tucks the bead into a special pouch just beneath the larva's jaws. Whenever the youngster wants a meal, it just bends its head down and takes a nibble. <laughs> In return for these lavish provisions and amenities, the ants mount a very energetic defense of the acacia, rushing to attack intruders. Any insect that lands on the tree, hoping to nibble a leaf or two, is soon dealt with. The ants even defend their tree against rival plants. Regular patrols go down the trunk and range for a long way over the surrounding earth. Seedlings that sprout within this area, so threatening to take some of the acacia's sustenance, are severely more. The ants aren't eating this plant, they're chewing it to death. that reach over and try to climb onto the acacia get similar treatment. Clearly, it's well worth the acacia's while to provide food and lodging for such a valiant and dedicated defense force.
probably wouldn't know if you did. They live in people's guts, and they eat some of your food. And we don't have much problem with tapeworms here in the United States because we poop in toilets. And we flush it and it goes to sewage treatment plants. But in countries where you poop on the ground or in the river or wherever, you can get tapeworm eggs in your feces, which can grow inside your gut if somehow those eggs get in your mouth. You know, if you got crap on, on your food. Um, the eggs get in your mouth, they live inside your gut, they grow into this big long worm. They can get, tapeworms can get 25 feet long. And people can be infected with a whole bunch of them too. And they mate inside your gut. It's pretty disgusting. They lay eggs that come out in your poop. I don't. Can we find video footage? No. Uh, probably. Tapeworm life cycle. I took a great class in college called parasitology. You might have a parasitology book. It was a fantastic class. Here's a small parasite. It's Oh, the one in the Amazon. Yeah. This one's up your pee? Like if yeah. you pee in like a river or something, it'll swim up your pee into your bladder. Up your, your urethra. Yeah, that's called your urethra. It's a bad day. I don't see my book. Anyway. Did you review video for this bit? Had a great, so. great class where we studied all the different types of worms you will have. Sounds like a great class. Most of them in Africa and Central America and um, just places where there's not poor, poor areas of the world. And, and all the places have in common that they don't have clean water and they don't have um, sewage treatment. That's the difference between having one and not having one. The one, one big goal of a lot of charitable organizations is to try and get clean water and sewage to everywhere in the world. That'll stop all the parasites, or a lot of them. Um, okay, we call it a foundation species if um, if they're uh, a species that makes up the foundation of a community. It's usually what we're talking about is one of the uh, the species at the bottom of the food chain, and coral is a good example. Coral is the foundation species of a coral reef ecosystem. The coral will grow, and do you know that inside the body of a coral are algae? Did you all ever learn this anywhere? Algae live along with the coral and do photosynthesis and make food. And that's kind of like the bottom of the food chain. And then there are fish that will eat the coral, and bigger fish that eat the little fish, and so forth. It makes a whole food chain. So the coral are called the foundation species. What do you think the foundation species of a marsh ecosystem is? The grass. The marsh grass. There you go. The book talks a bit about species richness. Here is a nice... Um, diagram showing the mammal species per square kilometer and you can see where most of the mammals in the world are usually around the equator where you get the most rainfall and the most sunlight you get high amounts of species up to 200 mammal species per square kilometer a square kilometer is about a little over half a mile in each direction Right? Pretty big, but that's a lot of different species of mammals. 200 species. That's in the dark areas. In the rainforests, that's where we have the most species. Have you all learned that before? Rainforests have the most species? Mm -hmm. So 
So we refer to that as the richness, the richness of the species. We ought to talk a little bit about island biogeography, since we live on an island. So there's this study in biology, and sometimes they'll throw it on the AP exam too, where they talk about island biogeography. Now, small islands have a certain amount of species living in them. Larger islands tend to have more. Does that make sense to y'all? Mm -hmm. Small islands, fewer species. Larger islands, more species. So that's a that's this graph. That is a that is a called a uh, positive correlation or a direct relationship. The larger the area of the island, the higher the number of species. So you get an arrow going up, kind of like this. A, an island far from the mainland will tend to have fewer species than an island near the mainland. Does that make sense? If you're far from the mainland, it's hard for new species to get to the island. If you're near the mainland, it's easier for species to get to the island. So that in this case, the number of species is inversely related to the distance from the mainland. The farther you get from the mainland, the fewer the number of species. We call that an inverse relationship. So whenever you see the arrow going up like this, that's called a direct relationship. When it goes down like this, it's called an inverse relationship. Have you all heard of that before? No? No, you have? Now look at this. This is a common graph they talk about in island biogeography. How do you read this graph? This graph is crazy. Well, there's two things on this graph. There's, there's lines, there's actually four lines, but the blue lines are showing the rate of immigration. The red lines are showing the rate of extinction. Do you know what immigration means? Is it movement away out of an area or movement to an area? Move, movement to the area. So, the rate of immigration, if and, and it's versus the number of species on the bottom. So, if you have a large amount of species on your island, you have low rates of immigration. So, in other words, if there's already a bunch of different species on the island, you're not going to have many new species coming to it. Does this make sense? Y'all got to try to make sense of graphs like this. They'll throw this on a test and you'll be like, what? Now, do you see if the island is close to the mainland, there are higher rates of immigration than if the island is far from the mainland. So, that's one thing that's happening to islands, is organisms are immigrating to islands from the mainland. Another thing that's happening on the islands is the organisms are going extinct. Extinction is shown in the red line. If there are many species, there's high levels of extinction. If there are few species, it would make sense you're not going to have much extinction. If there's hardly any species, you're not going to have many species going extinct. So this is a direct relationship we have with these lines. Small islands have greater rates of extinction than large islands. That also makes sense. If you're large, you have a lot of places to go. It would be harder to go extinct if you have a lot of area. If you're small, it's easier to go extinct. So extinction tends to lower the number of species. Immigration raises the number of species. So they have lines, they have little dashed lines where these, where these meet. A large island close to the mainland. You see where those two lines meet? The large island and the close to the mainland, they meet right there. Large islands close to the mainland have the most species. That's D. There. Immigration 
and their extinction rates equal out right there. So they're going to have the most species. What have the least species according to this? Far from mainland, small islands. Far from mainland, small islands have the least number of species. Is that not a cool graph? It makes sense, right? If the, if the island is small and it's far from the mainland, it would have the least species. They're very likely to throw this graph at you. I've seen it before. And ask you some questions about it. And the answers might be A, B, C, or D. It's multiple choice. Dylan, is this exciting to you? Way to be honest. You're not into island biogeography. It's fun to say. Everybody say island biogeography. Island biogeography. Isn't that good? Sounds, you sound smart if you say that. Somebody asks you what you're studying, say island biogeography. I don't think you're cool. Nerd. Even though you're not. <laughs> okay, um, what about keystone species? You ever heard of a keystone species? Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you know what a keystone is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's a keystone? It's the top stone in an arch. And it's the top stone in an arch. So when you're building an arch, you build this part of the arch, and you build this part of the arch, and where they two come together, there's a stone in the middle where they lean together. And if you were to pull out the keystone, the whole thing would crumble. Architecture. How many are going to be an architect when they grow up? Maybe. Nathan Brock? Yeah. He's an architect. And Leanne. Leanne. His wife. Oh, his wife. Okay. <laughs> I was saying, I was thinking you had a sister or something I didn't know about. Or an aunt or something. Okay, so, uh, um, a key, the keystone is very important to the arch, right? Well, the keystone species is very important to the survival of a community. This is a um, type of starfish called Pizaster is the genus. And um, if you were to remove this starfish from its community, you would have all kinds of issues because the starfish is kind of the top of the food chain. And it eats, it eats these uh, mussels. And um, if you remove the starfish, and we know this because starfishes are, were killed by the fishermen. They didn't like them because they were eating the mussels. And so the fishermen killed the starfish in a certain area in Massachusetts, I think. And then the mussels got out of control and started just multiplying like crazy. And then uh, whatever they eat, since their numbers are so great, then they run... Um, Whatever they're eating, I don't know what the mussels were eating. It's just strain plankton from the water, I guess. But when their numbers got real high, then the plankton got real low. And then, of course, that affects fish that eat plankton. And you can see the whole ecosystem is just thrown into chaos. So a keystone species is a very important species to an area. Uh, this is talking about invasive species. If you move a species from one place to another, it may very well not have any natural predators or not have anything that has evolved to be able to eat it. And so it might just grow um, and multiply and get in huge numbers. So these are all invasive species. The invasive species you, you talk about ar around, um, have you ever heard of kudzu? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You ever, like right around in Atlanta up there, it grows really, it doesn't grow as well down here as it does in colder climate. Man, it's just everywhere. It was brought from Japan to stabilize the roadsides, and it doesn't have any insects naturally here that eat it, but like it does in Japan. So here it just kind of grows like crazy. They Why brought in goats those? to control it. Why not bring the insects over? I don't know. Well, like maybe there is. That could be. Uh, there's another invasive. 
I don't know if we want to keep bringing invasive species in to try and solve problems, but. Um. Okay, let's talk about succession. So, succession is when you go from a community with very few species or no species to a community that has a whole lot of different species. We call it ecological succession. So here's an example of that. Here's a field that has been cut, I don't know, it had corn or something in it. And after they, they didn't replant it, they just decided to let it grow back on its own. So here it looked after year one and after second year and fifth year and the tenth year and the twentieth year. And maybe if you came and looked at it after fifty years, it'd be a whole forest there. We call that ecological succession. There's a succession. There's a succession of species that, that take over. And the first organisms that grow in an area are called the pioneer species. Have you ever heard of that? So it's usually like lichens or grasses, weeds, just something that grows real fast. It doesn't need a whole lot of nutrients and that sort of thing. They'll be the first to go into an area. And then, see, like we have grasses now after two years. Those grasses will die and decompose and make the soil more nutritious. And when the soil gets enough nutrition in it, that's enough to support larger plants, like bushes and trees. They need a lot of nutrients in the soil, and grasses don't need as much. So the grasses come first, and the trees come later once the soil is rich. So um, we, there's a succession. And if you talk about how many organisms how many different types of species you have, which is species richness. We have a low species richness here at the beginning and a high species richness at the end. This is what we see as we go through this ecological succession. So the pioneer species first, and then there's intermediate species along the way, and you finally get to this community at the end that's called the climax community. And that is uh, the, the most rich community. Now, there's two types of succession that you have to know. There's primary succession. And there's secondary succession. The primary succession is when an area recovers from bare rock. No soil. Where in nature might you find just bare rock? Lava. A lava flow. Great example. In Hawaii, the lava, liquid hot magma, comes out of the earth and forms <laughs> lava, which spreads all over. Sometimes entire new islands come up out of the ocean, just made of lava. And it cools and hardens, and it's rock, and it's just sitting there. It won't be rock forever. We call this primary succession because there's no soil. When it's primary, soil has yet to been made or established. So the first thing that has to happen is the, the, the lava has to be eroded into sand. And what will happen is lichens will grow on the surface of the rock, and lichens will digest the, the rock a little bit and break it down into sand. And it takes a long time, but it'll happen. And then the lichen will die and leave some of their dead body along with the sand. And voila, you have some soil. The dead bodies of the lichen and the sand from the weathered, eroded lava. We're getting going here, aren't we? It's just a thin layer at first. Maybe some seeds carried by bird dung land in the sand, in the, in the little bit of dirt you form. And maybe it sprout a little weed. And now you got a little greenery. That's how it starts. It takes hundreds of years to finally get nice, thick soil. Even thousands of years. That's primary succession. Primary succession takes a long time. Another example would be just like a, an old road, an old abandoned parking lot. There's no soil there, it's just cement. You know, an old tennis court that somebody lets go. You know, you got to. You gotta break up all that court first before you can get growth on it. it. Takes a long time. Secondary succession 
is when you already have the soil. There's already established soil, but something clears the soil, like that um, the field here. There's already soil there, and they just clear it off by picking the, the crops. Or you could have a forest fire. Come through an area, just a real bad fire, and kill everything. You still got the dirt, and stuff comes back pretty quickly. Secondary succession happens fast. You could you could go from from here to here uh, to to a forest in maybe 50 years, a um, hundred years. Primary succession t might take a thousand. Would you like to see video footage? Oh, here's another look at it. Video footage of ecological succession. With the example of the nitrogen cycle, we have seen how certain chemicals can dramatically. That's terrible. We don't want to do this. So if you don't already know, Grammarly is an online writing system. It pretty much helps users become more clear and effective with it. Sorry, no, 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 no,